Good afternoon. I, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that one real asset that we have here in the United States in terms of addressing uh, policies uh, towards Iran is that we have a, a large and well-educated and politically involved Iranian-American community. Indeed, I know, yes, it's, it's um, and we have a lot to learn from them. I don't know of any, any uh, country we've been in a crisis with where we've had you know, such a large, well-educated, politically involved uh, uh, diaspora community. And you know, it, there's obviously, as we even noticed this, today, we, we, there, there are differences of opinion. There are a few, you know, um, um, unrepentant monarchists and Ahmed Shalabi wannabes and, and other hardliners, uh, but but by and large, uh, uh, Iranians, uh, Iranian Americans, uh, feel the same way most Iranians themselves do. They don't like the regime, but they don't want war. And uh, I, and I really want to thank the um, organizing committee to, to 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 bring in Iranian American voices because I think it's very very important to do that. I, I want to first address the, the question around, around nationalism that, that was brought up because I, and as I've noticed for years, particularly my most recent visit to Iran, uh, is, is that strong sense of nationalism. And it looks like a number of you are old enough to remember the Vietnam War. And uh, one, the big mistake the United States made in Vietnam is we saw communism. And the way to deal with communism uh, was to, uh, to respond with massive military force, seeing as this totalitarian movement that was spreading around the world we had to stop. And we missed the fact that though the North Vietnamese government was of course communist and the uh, uh, National Liberation Front, what we call the Viet Cong, was uh, a communist led, that it was first and foremost a nationalist revolution. And so we wondered why the more troops we sent, the more bombs we dropped, the more and more the resistance. And this is exactly the same mistake we're making in Iran. We see it as this Islamic Republic. Um, although a lot of Iranians would say it's neither. But, uh, but, but we look at the Islamist, Islamist character of it. And, um, and, and, and instead of the fact that the regime has been very, very uh, adept at manipulating the strong nationalist sentiments. I mean, you know, you know traveling around Iran in the spring, you know, I, I, there were far more flags and nationalist slogans than there were religious imagery. And if you look at the trend since the revolution, that when the pressure has been, when there's been less pressure on Iran, when they felt more secure, that's when reformers within the government and dissidents outside the government have made the most progress. But it's when Iran has felt threatened, that's when the government's cracked down on both reformers within as well as, as, as dissidents without. Uh, in other words, we're playing right into the hands of the uh, reactionary clerics and the other ultra-conservative uh, elements uh, within the um, Islamic Republic, uh, the hardliners on both sides are playing off uh, of each other. Uh, in my meeting with uh, the Iranian foreign minister, Javad Sarif, he's considered one of the more moderate figures in the government. He talked about how there's a lot of pressure from the hardliners over the nuclear agreement. And they're saying, you're being a fool to trust the United States. We're going to have to destroy billions of dollars worth of, uh, of hardware and um, centrifuges, you process uraniums, et cetera, et cetera, in return for the promise of lifting sanctions. You know, what, 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 you know, can you really trust the United States? And he said, yeah, we, we trust the United States. And sure enough, Trump comes along, ha ha, fooled you. We're going to reimpose sanctions, not just U.S. sanctions. Remember that the, the U.S. is also sanctioning any country or any company that deals with Iran. So essentially, it's imposed all, almost all the sanctions back on the Iranians, even though they were in full compliance of the agreement. Uh, and and you know, so really, you, you, you really wonder what, uh, you know, uh, you know why, why, why would we do this? Well, uh, the, the complaints the United States has about Iran are, are, are um, in themselves reasonable. Uh, we don't like the fact that uh, Iran is, uh, is a repressive regime, a militaristic regime, that, one that discriminates against women and religious uh, minorities, um, that it supports um, 
ex uh, 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 dictatorial regimes and extremist movements. But you know, every single one of those things you could also say about Saudi Arabia and more. I mean, Saudi Arabia is worse in each one of those categories than Iran, and yet we are selling billions of dollars of military hardware to that country. And we have a government that praises it. And indeed, even if you look at the Democratic platform in, uh, in, in 2016, again, this is not just Trump and the Republicans, Democratic Republicans, in, in, in 2016, they went on and on about how nasty Iran was, but also said that uh, we, um, we, uh, you know, we, we need to increase our security uh, co uh, cooperation with Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf monarchies. Uh, so it's not. So, so let, let's not pretend that the uh, that the, 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 our motivation about uh, in, in hostility towards Iran has to do with the fact they have a nasty, repressive, corrupt government. Because some of our best friends are nasty, repressive, corrupt governments. The reason that we are hostile to Iran is that it's, um, it, 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 it refuses to be held under U.S. hegemonic uh, designs in the region. Uh, they, if you look at the uh, you know, National Security Statement in 2002, it called for full spectrum dominance, meaning that not only would we fight the rise of a, a potential uh, rival superpower, but any regional power that dared challenge uh, U.S. Uh, he hegemony. Um, but the fact is, is that uh, Iran has been a major regional power on and off for 2,500 years. You know, uh, we're treating it like some kind of banana republic, you know, that we could just kind of push around and, 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 do, uh, and do our bidding. That's not going to work. Indeed, I, I, I talked to, to countless ordinary Iranians, including some dissidents uh, in, 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 my, in my travels, and I was amazed at just how frank people were at coming up and complaining about how awful the regime was. I mean, even, even like in the, in the, in the, in the Bazaar and Isfahan and other public areas where presumably were there, there, were, there could be plain clothes went around. They had no qualms about coming up an American and, and telling about how awful uh, the government was <laughs> and how much they hated the government. But every single one of them said, U.S. policy is wrong. It is hurting us. The threat of war uh, is, it, it, I mean, it, it's terrible. Even the sanctions the, the regime is using as an excuse for their economic screw-ups, who are they're responsible for at least half of the <laughs> economic mess we're in, and now they can blame everything on the U.S. And you know, I, tra I talked to a prominent trade unionist who said, oh, this is really hurting us. We, we're really getting momentum, you know, uh, in terms of challenging the government, because it, 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 it's, uh, you know, like, like our government, uh, they use this, this populist nationalist rhetoric and religiosity to cover and, and to get working class support when in fact they're, they're pursuing policies that are really hurting the working class and enriching themselves and, and, and other, other elites. Um, the, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, in my, my um, meetings with, with, my meeting with, with Sharif, I was with, with a small group of academics and peace activists. We met with him for, for uh, over an hour. Um, he told about the 10 years of posturing and two years of intense negotiations, including 50 face-to-face -face meetings with John Kerry to hammer out every single line in the uh, uh, nuclear agreement. And this idea that, that, that Trump says, oh, we'll pressure them and they'll give in and, 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 and renegotiate something uh, e even, even stronger. You know, that's not going to work. That's just plain not going to work. I was, I was upset to find that Senator Booker and some of the Democrats are agreeing that we need to renegotiate. Uh, and no country, self-respecting country, especially Iran, is going to do that with a gun in its head. And, you know, you know there's actually been a, a social scientist has have a, had a survey of, of uh, attitudes towards uh, nationalism and patriotism by country to have various measures. And this will be no surprise to you who, um, who are a, a person of reigning background or, or know people of that background. Guess who is number one in the world? <laughs> yes, Iranians are the most nationalistic people in the world. And again, this kind of pressure is, is going to be totally, a totally a, a counter, um, a counterproductive and is, is, is forcing Iranians, even those who, the, the centers, to uh, rally around the flag in the face of um, of uh, this, um, uh, this kind of, uh, of, of, of pressure. The, um, and 
of course, the United States is even more isolated in the international community than we are. Uh, we were around Iraq. Um, you know, everybody else in the nuclear agreement, you know, was satisfied with it, is, 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 is moving forward. And outside of Israel and a couple of uh, Gulf monarchies, I mean, there's, there, there's no, no, really no support for uh, pressuring uh, uh, this. Um, the, the, the claims that, there are, the, 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 that uh, create this latest round of crisis, that there are supposedly threats against uh, U.S. assets. Uh, the, the, for example, the British Major General, who was deputy commander of the U.S.-led uh, Coalition of International Forces uh, uh, in, the, in the region, said he, there's been no increased threat from Iranian-backed uh, 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 forces. Um, there, really is, there, there really is no... Um, no, uh, you know, justification whatsoever. The, um, I mean, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad that there has been uh, at least um, some. Uh, the Democrats who generally went right along with the um, Bush administration uh, 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 lies around Iraq have been showing a little bit of a um, uh, uh, backbone. Uh, though I'm concerned that, for example, in the Democratic platform, it said that if, uh, um, uh, if uh, Iran violated the nuclear agreement, uh, quote, the U.S. should not hesitate to take military action. Um, and of course, that, that, that's, uh, that's scary because Iran now is in violation, obviously in reaction to the U.S. violating uh, the agreement, but um, that um, this is disturbing because the, the UN ratification of the nuclear agreement uh, was under Article 41, uh, which uh, empowers the Security Council to decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to, the, to its decision. So basically, the Democratic platform, like the Republican platform, are calling the US to violate the UN Charter, just as we did in Iraq, um, to, to attack uh, Iran. And you know, the fact that we had such hawkish things, I mean, Hillary Clinton was actually an opponent, uh, you know, when she was Secretary of State, uh, was against um, the efforts by Obama and others to negotiate agreement. She had, uh, you know, attacked Obama for being naive during the campaign in, in 2008 about wanting to, to, to negotiate with, with Iran. Um, so, you know, there's this hawkish wing of the Democratic Party, and what, what, what excites me is that the anti-war uh, movement has been strong enough that it appears that most Democrats are actually opposing military action or fighting back. This is very different than it was in 2003, and I think we frankly have to give credit to ourselves for, um, for uh, you know, pushing <laughs> the way we have that has made war um, less likely. But the, the scary part is, is that, you know, and in fact, there's some, there's an argument made that Trump himself doesn't even want war. He's just trying to threaten things, despite what Bolton and Pompeo and some of the other, other people uh, are, are pushing. But there's still a real danger of war, uh, because when you're in a hair trigger like we are right now, like with the drone incident and things like that, you can see uh, any, any uh, manner of scary scenarios that which the United States would use uh, as an excuse to attack. Uh, for example, uh, the, the um, the U.S. government, uh, along with much of the media, have referring to various armed groups around the uh, Middle East as uh, Iranian proxies. Um, and, and, and Iran does have a number of allies in the region, but, but proxies, you know, if a proxy implies that they are doing the bidding of their, of their ally. So let's take a scenario where the Houthis um, in retaliation for Saudi bombing uh, you know, of a civilian area, as Saudis have been doing, lobbed some rockets into a Saudi airbase, as they have been doing. Uh, you know, an individual Houthi commander you know, could do that. They've done that. But you know, there are a lot of American service people on these uh, uh, Saudi bases. What if one of these rockets kills an American serviceman? Then you, you, you better believe that the, uh, the, uh, the United States says, ah, Iran attacked the United States. <laughs> Even though Iran knew, knew nothing about it, and and we could see this as as then an excuse to um, and to launch a war, uh, and 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 that's where I want to. Um, so we need to remain uh, active. We need to really really push this, and and it's it's um it's been 
and it's, it's difficult in, in a lot of ways, and that you, know, you are having people push back. Now, I've been someone who's worked very closely with the, uh, with the human rights activists within Iran and their allies within the Iranian-American community. I was a very prominent and vocal supporter of the Green Revolution, for example. Uh, and yet, if you Google my name and Iran, the first things come up are attacks by Campus Watch, Middle East Forum, other right-wing groups that say I am a shill for Iran. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, no, no, I mean, seriously, I, I, it's every, in fact, every time I give a talk in the Bay Area, in fact, there may be somebody from there right now because they, they, they follow me around, I've gotten more attacks on this by, by, uh, than I have on Israel-Palestine. And I do a lot of work in Israel Palestine, so it kind of gives you an idea that there are um, you know, organized right wing groups allied with the uh, Trump administration and, and other hawks uh, to basically disparage anybody who um, opposes war and, and questions U.S. policy as some kind of, 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 of shill or an apologist uh, for what virtually all of us acknowledge is a nasty uh, reactionary regime. And I think we also need to look at it, finally, my final thought is I want to look at it in a, in a broader sense. Let's not just focus on Trump. Let's not say, oh, it's a Zionist lobby or whatever. What this is about is hegemony, you know, which has been an issue for a long, long time. I mean, just Think for a second. Israel, Pakistan, and India are also in are, are currently in violation of UN Security Council resolutions regarding their nuclear program. They actually have nuclear weapons. Yet the US has blocked enforcement of those uh, resolutions. In fact, the United States supplies all three countries with nuclear capable aircraft. I mean, and, and so and yet, you know, yet we, they insist that the United States can't even process, uh, sorry, the United States insists that Iran can't even process uranium for you know, civilian production. I mean, think about that. You know, the Iranian nuclear agreement was one sided against Iran. I mean, every single nuclear agreement I know, there is some degree of reciprocity. Not to mention the fact that the United States, along with the other five other original uh, nuclear powers, are in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which specifically says, in return for other countries not developing nuclear weapons, the five nuclear, the existing nuclear states would take good faith efforts to have complete nuclear disarmament. And so again, let, let's let's let, let's look at this in the broader sense, and not not just you know. Um, you know, you put it in, put it in, in isolation, and because, because uh, you know, we might be, able, hopefully, hopefully, we'll be able to prevent war with Iran, but you know, there are going to be more wars, and 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 and, and threats of wars, unless we are willing to, uh, you know, challenge U.S. hegemony and many of the assumptions that, unfortunately, both political parties, uh, see, and much of the mainstream media seem to uh, continue to subscribe to. Right.